So now we're going to look at suborder Pinnipedia. Uh, this is the suborder that contains walruses, sea lions, and seals. Uh, the name pinniped refers to their, um, their flippers. They call them feather-footed because their, um, their hind limbs and their forelimbs have this kind of feathery looking appearance to the end of the flipper. So um, within this, we have three groups. We have family Ataridae, and that's the eared seals. So sea lions are in this example. Um, eared seals means that they have an external ear that you can see. Um, this is as opposed to family Phocidae, that's true seals, um, that have a little tiny hole, but they don't have an actual external ear flap. Um, family Obodenidae is the walruses, and um, these guys also don't have external ears. So if anything, they're more like the family Phocidae. So some other big distinctions between these guys is kind of important. People tend to say seal and sea lion interchangeably like they're the same animal. Um, but members of family Otaridae and members of family Phocidae actually have some pretty significant physiolo phys physiological differences. So um, for example, Phocidae, so this would be the true seals in this top example, um, you can see their skeletal structure is quite a bit different. They do not walk around on land with their hind limbs. They are incapable of that sort of waddling motion. Um, when they get up on land, they have to flop kind of like a little, um, like a worm, doing the worm on the beach. And um, when they swim in the water, they use their hind flippers for propulsion, and they swim them back and forth like this, kind of swishing. They don't use their fore flippers for propulsion. So that's a big thing about family Phocidae, the true seals. Um, now, sea lions um, and fur seals are in the category of Ataridae. That's the eared seals. And um, that's this bottom example right here. So Ataridae have, as you can see, a very different hind limb structure. Um, you know, if you've ever been to SeaWorld or you've seen sea lions performing, you see them walking around on land. They kind of waddle with their back limbs um, while they sort of stand mostly on their forelimbs. And that's something that family Ataridae can do, but family Phocidae cannot do. So um, sea lions also use their forelip, forefins, their foreflippers, for the majority of their propulsion. So they're flapping their forelimbs up and down to move around, um, which is very different than how the true seals, um, they go back and forth with their hind limbs. And so those are some big differences between them, other than their ear being external or, inter or internal. Um, most of the time, too, family um, Ataridae, the sea lions, tend to be a little bit more loud and vocal, although there are some exceptions to that. Um, true seals, for the most part, tend to be a little bit more quiet. However, um, if you've ever been to, say, San Simeon in California, you might have seen um, the huge elephant seals. And they are an example of family Phocidae that can be extremely loud. So there are some exceptions there. Um, all of them, though, they have very th thick fat layers. Um, they have a round head, very flexible movement, very graceful movement, um, very good senses in the water. In fact, their whiskers serve the same purpose as does um, a dog or a cat, and that's to detect subtle um, changes in the room around them, or in this case, in the water around them. Um, they all have a tiny vestigial tail. So if I go back up, you can see a little tail here. And there actually is one on Phocidae, but it's kind of hard to see. Um, so again, that's a remnant of their ancestry, being that they came from a land animal originally. Um, they're very fast swimmers. Most of them can go up to 18 miles an hour. Um, really good divers, too. In fact, in particular, uh, members of Phocidae, the, uh, the true seals, can stay down as long as 80 minutes. So they can dive a lot, um, and they can get very deep when they're fishing and hunting, and they can um, hold their breaths. And more importantly, uh, as you'll see later in the week when you do your bratty cardio lab, there's some pretty amazing adaptations they have for being able to um, keep their metabolism up while they're diving that long. Um, so some other things, reproduction, uh, they tend to leave the water during mating season. So mating occurs on the beaches, um, and that's where babies are born. They're born up on the beach. In a lot of cases, the bulls will fight each other for territories. Um, in the case of sea lions and in the case of walruses, um, they can establish harems where there's one male with a bunch of females. So it's a polygamous um, dynamic there. And uh, what's neat is that the females will give birth to the previous mating season's babies before they mate with the new males for the upcoming season. And um, mating is usually annual, so once a year is the mating season. And what's interesting is that a lot of um, members of this subphylum, or I'm sorry, um, suborder, have what we call seasonal delayed implantation. So they might mate during the mating season, but then the blastocyst will not implant into the female's uterus until um, time 
passes by when there's a little bit better water temperature, when there's uh, more access to food. It's like it waits until it's more convenient and there, therefore there's a better chance of the offspring surviving once it's born. So that's kind of interesting that it can delay if it needs to. Um, two to three weeks of lactation period. So um, the babies don't actually nurse for terribly long. And um, that's particularly for the cold weather animals. Um, it's too much stress on the female to be nursing while she's trying to maintain her own body temperature as well. So the babies learn to hunt very quickly and they don't nurse for very long. So a little bit more close look at the eared seals, um, sea lions, of course, they're also very intelligent, very playful, curious. Um, they can be kind of a, nu a nuisance in some cases to kayakers or divers. Um, I remember in Monterey diving a lot and sea lions would just kind of swim up to you and sometimes they'd smack you around a little bit just to see what you're going to do. You know, they just brush up against you with their fins, um, but they're usually pretty harmless. They're pretty playful. Um, that's actually me. That's um, a beach in the Galapagos, and those are uh, the Galapagos sea lions, who are very, very uh, genetically similar to the California sea lions, which are these guys. They're the ones that you'll see at marine parks as well. Um, fur seals, again, they're actually uh, considered kind of part of the sea lion clan, even though they're called a seal. Um, these guys have a very, very thick woolly undercoat. They were almost hunted to extinction, but now they're starting to bounce back a little bit. Um, but mostly their fur was the reason for their hunting. It's very good. Um, they were hunted down to only about 200,000 in 1914, and now they're protected, so they're, they're rebounding very well. So we'll get into the true seals, so family Fauchidae. Um, so again, their forelimbs are a little closer to their head. They don't use their forelimbs for propulsion so much and they can't walk on land. They have to kind of slide on the ice or they do the, you know, the worm, so to speak. They kind of um, flub along to get from one place to another. Um, with family Fauchidae, there's usually no harems. Usually it's just one male, one female for an entire breeding season. And then the following season, they'll, they'll switch partners. Um, crab eater seals are, are, that's this seal right here. Uh, they're the most abundant, actually. We don't see them much here um, at all, actually, in the United States. But What's the funny thing is they don't actually eat crabs. <laughs> I don't know where they get their name exactly, but they eat krill and plankton. Uh, harbor seals are very common. If you're along the California coast, uh, you see these guys a lot. They tend to feed by themselves and hunt by themselves. You tend to see them more solitary. They don't tend to hang out in big groups like the sea lions do. Uh, harp seals in the North Atlantic, unfortunately, these are the ones that are notoriously uh, clubbed almost to extinction um, for their fur. Their fur is very thick and warm and valuable. Leopard seals in Antarctica, you've probably seen them in movies. They're kind of a top predator in the Antarctic waters. Um, orcas are the only things that eat them down there. Elephant seals, I've told you about before. These guys, um, California coast, they can actually make a very loud noise. Um, this nostril is kind of a resonating chamber for males, so it has to do with territory and protecting their females. So um, lastly, we'll look at walruses. Um, walruses have very bulky bodies. They don't have an external ear. Um, so they have some features that are kind of, kind of like the sea lions and some features that are kind of like the true seals. Um, stiff bristles on their nose. The males, of course, are known for these very um, large tusks for fighting. And um, that's unfortunately why they've also been hunted down quite a bit is the tusks have some value. Um, sometimes they can be pretty large. Uh, they can be 10 to 16 feet long. They'll eat mollusks, and um, you'll see them diving down to the bottom to pick up clams and crack them open. These guys also have harems, um, and some gruesome facts about them. Sometimes the males will try to eat the babies of other males, um, mostly so that they can kind of ensure that their own genetics are being preferred in the next generation as opposed to some other males. So anyway, that summarizes... Um, this group summarizes the pinnipeds. So when you think of pinnipeds, you're going to think of seals, sea lions, and walruses.